coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. The more you can plan your meals based on your week, and I, and I, and I like to get pretty granular. Like if I have a day where I'm just slammed and I know I'm going to be slammed, then that's a day where I would meal plan uh, a slow cooked meal, one that I could throw everything in at the morning turn it on, schedule it, whatever. And then it's done when I'm done with my day. So that way I don't have to, you know, in the middle of the day, start my food or do anything to it. So I really like to meal plan like that based on how busy the day is. Maybe I slow cook, maybe a different meal is like a simple one pot meal, you know, and then I get a little bit fancier, maybe on the weekend or something like that. But Meal planning is great because you have a list. You go to the grocery store. You're not making any impulse buys. You just follow that list and you only buy what you're going to be using. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed CEO of Pluck, James Berry. James has spent 16 plus years in the culinary field as a private chef for the likes of Tom Cruise, George Clooney, and John Cusack. He's also been the chef on Vans Warp Tour, traveled to 50 North American cities, started a food delivery company, and now has started an organ-based all-purpose seasoning called Pluck. It's an easy and delicious way to get organ meats into your diet. I've been using it myself and I do love it. We also discuss why it's important to get organ meats in your diet, the importance of meal planning for your health, best foods to use pluck in, his favorite celebrity to cook for, and his one tip to get your body back to what it once was. This was a great interview with James. I know you'll enjoy it. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the interview. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. And my guest today is James Berry. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, CEO of an organ-based seasoning company called Pluck, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, we just, we just um, debuted in uh, January of 2021 this year. Oh, okay. And before that, uh, perhaps maybe, I know you did some, you're, you've been in the culinary field for quite a while. Uh, yeah, what, what else have, have you done uh, before you, you did Pluck? Well, so I, I, I got into um, cooking. I always loved cooking, but I got into it in my 30s. And so I've been in it now um, over 16 years. And I, when I got into it, I knew I wanted to work privately with clients. Um, so I started out working with celebrities. I worked with a lot of um, trainers and their clients. Um, and eventually... I wanted to expand beyond people that just had money. So I, I created a, a meal delivery service in Los Angeles and I ran that for eight years. Um, and then between then and now I did recipes for cookbooks. Um, there's one, I did a recipe for eat naked. It's just a book by, uh, it's a nutrition book by Margaret Floyd. And then, um, the naked foods cookbook is the follow-up cookbook. And then I recently did, um, uh, Dr. Alejandro Younger's um, newest book, which is called Clean Seven. I did the recipes for that. Mm. So been in the field a long time. And, and a lot of my specialty is really in helping people to eat healthy, um, uh, but to do it in a way where they don't feel deprived. That's That seems to be yeah. mm -hmm. still one of the biggest issues with people eating healthy is they associate it as, as bland and not, not interesting. And so... Um, that's always been one of my mission is, is kind of dispel that. And, and that's really why I came up with pluck. I mean, to me, organs are, are one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. And yet we're not eating them. I mean, the majority of people aren't, eating, I think you said you and your, your, your wife eat them, but it's like, I, you know, <laughs> not minority. many people do. I think it's, I think it's like less than 1% actually do. Um, and yet we are, over 30% of the world is nutrient deficient. So clearly we have issues, right? I mean, and it's not around calories. Right. <laughs> That's clearly not the issue because we're, you know, we have an obesity epidemic. Um, so, so that was really what I was trying to solve with, with pluck is how can I get the most nutrient dense food into your diet without you 
thinking it's icky without you knowing how to cook it, without you needing to know how to cook it, with just, just kind of get over that hump. Yeah, no, that's such an, actually, you know, it's one of these ideas that you, that now that I see, and I have one with me right here for people watching, um, is when I saw, when I saw the product and the idea, it's one of those ideas where you're like, God, why, why didn't I think of it? <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I'm kind of I'm kind of blown away that I thought about it. I mean, because it, it it is the first of its kind. There's no right. other product like it out there, and I'm kind of blown away that in today's day and age, I figured out a product that doesn't exist yet. I mean, it's just you don't see that anymore. So I, I'm in awe as well. <laughs> yeah, right. Which nowadays is crazy because I feel like there's something for someone out there um, if you search hard enough. Uh, and you are right. I mean, we're over consuming calories and under consuming nutrients, right? I would say. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's just this stigma around organs and eating organs. And when you say it to people, they just, you know, they're like, oh my God, oh, we're having liver tonight. <laughs> you know, I think liver was a thing back in the day. I remember like my grandma and grandfather used to have like liver and tongue. And it's yeah. like, I feel part of part of it is just if you don't hear it in the mainstream and it you know you don't go to Whole Foods and you don't see an aisle of organ um, meats and you know maybe that'll change one day. What are your thoughts around that? <laughs> well, it is it's fascinating, and I've had many conversations with um, my mom with uh, with people older people you know in their seventies because you really do have to go to that age to find people that actually grew up with it. It's sad. I can't just say, Oh, well, your parents probably ate it. Cause that dates me. Right. Cause now, <laughs> cause if you're younger than I am, then mo no, probably your parents didn't eat it. Um, right. but, but it's fascinating cause I talk to them and they all say like, they're all like, yeah, I actually liked it or yeah, it was good. So it wasn't, it was a food that was eaten and it wasn't pressure around eating. It was just like, well, not for everyone. Of course, there were some that were pressured into eating liver and onions whenever they served it. Right. But the ones I've talked to, they said they actually liked it. But then when I say, well, why don't you eat it now? No one has an answer, like nobody. And it's like, <laughs> well, so what is going on? Um, from my research, I do know that <clears throat> I do know that organs back in the day were seen as uh, and when I say back in the day, I'm talking around pre-World War II. Um, they were seen as poor people food. For some reason, yeah. economy came into the, the situation. So, so eating nicer cuts of meat were seen as more luxurious. So a lot of people gravitated towards, you know, wanting to purchase nicer cuts of meats because it, it represents status symbol, mm -hmm. right? But then when World War II happened, the U.S. was concerned uh, due to all the protein, the muscle meat that was going abroad for the soldiers. They were worried of a shortage. And so they actually started a campaign, the federal campaign, trying to educate and support people in eating organ meats, because that they saw that as the main option towards, you know, um, getting sustenance, getting the protein, getting the nutrients without relying on muscle meat. And it worked. They people, that's why our great grandparents, our grandparents, that's why they were eating organ meat, because it was not only was it emphasized by our government, it was affordable. And it was available, but that nowadays I talk to people, most people don't know how to get it. They don't know where to get it. Most people don't know how to cook it. Right. And, um, and then, you know, and then they just don't want to touch it. Like you talk, I mean, tongue is, tongue is very prevalent in the Mexican culture. You go to a Mexican restaurant, it's called Lengua. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's delicious. I mean, for those that have not tried it, it is hands down wow. delicious. I highly recommend it. It cooks very similarly to a muscle meat. Um, you can, you can slow cook it, you could pressure cook it, you braise it, but what people don't want to deal with is So when you get the tongue, it's got a sheath around it. You know, it's got this kind of hair, tongue hairs on it. It's got a thick sheath and you have to, when you cook it, you then peel that off after it cooks and it comes off really easily, but because it, I think it's mm. just different for people. They don't want to, yeah. <laughs> they don't want to deal with it. But if you did deal with it, you'd find out that underneath that sheath, it's this beautiful shreddable, like muscle meat that is delicious and takes on the flavor. Just like if you were eating pulled pork or barbacoa or something like that, it's just so, so good. Yeah. I mean, you know, I see it more and more, maybe cause I'm in the health game and there's more companies I find that are popping up like, um, I just got recently liver crisps are almost like chips, but they're, you know, 
good liver and there's some salt and maybe a little bit of onion, but really clean. Um, and then obviously your company popping up. So I, I do feel like it's going to maybe, maybe it'll make a bit of a comeback. Um, you know, as opposed to just always eating muscle meats, um, you know, you wonder if you'll, you'll start seeing it in, in, in grocery stores. I think that that'll be the telltale sign is if it starts getting into like the whole foods of the worlds and, um, that it might make a little, a little bit of a comeback. Cause you got to wonder with all the conventional raised meat that we have in society, what we're, and you probably know this maybe with your company and doing research, where does all the rest of the, the, um, the cow go? Yeah, I do actually. Um, it, it's interesting. So we, we do not have a very, uh, we don't have an established supply chain for organ meats for human consumption. And I have to really classify it or stress that it's for human consumption because it is a falsehood that people think the whole animal is not used. The whole animal in the U anywhere in the world is used. Oh. They just, a lot of times it's just not used for human food. It's used for pet food. It's used for zoo food. It's used to refeed the, the uh, conventional animals. I mean, that's where technically that's where mad cow disease came from is because they were sick cows and then they were, they were basically um, like, like chopping fat. them up and then refeeding them to the cows and the seat and the cows are getting sick. So um, th there's, it's common practice that every part of the animal gets used, but you have to go to other countries like New Zealand or Argentina to actually find parts of the animal that are for human consumption. And even then they're not USDA. What they are is they're um, considered a dietary supplement. So mm. it's FDA when it comes to the U S once it's imported. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm actually trying to do. Cause I'm, I'm a really, my proponent, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of nose to tell eating. I really think that that uh, is one of the things that is lacking from every diet right now. Even someone that's carnivore, you talk to a hardcore carnivore, mm -hmm. They're still not eating the organ meats. <laughs> yeah, I know a few. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, I mean, there are some. I should I should say the hardcore ones are, but the ones that are just kind of following it because they think it's the best way to eat. They're they're not doing the organ meats, and um and I really think that one of the the reasons why we have so many chronic health issues is because we're not eating enough nose to tail, mm -hmm. and um and that is what I'm trying to help change. I mean, I I have ideas for other ways of getting animal organs into our diet but the key is finding and or establishing the supply chain like because i i'm i'm trying to source the organs here domestically because yeah. i my first run i got them from new zealand which as i said new zealand is set up for the um the supply chain that you can get pretty much almost every organ from there and that's where most of the supplement companies get their organs yeah um it's really clean country in terms of the how they're raised how they're produced um but i'm we, trying to establish it here domestically and i'm already running into issues where i can't find a meat processor for example that's doing pancreas or i can't find meat processors that are doing certain organs and it's just you know, you hmm. talk to them, they're like, well, it's just because there's either not a supply chain for it or a need, or they don't want it. They're just not set up to it because you have to, you have to kind of, you know, slice it a little bit more, for example, you know, you have to, you have to be a little bit more conscientious of one because <laughs> I was Probably. talking to one rancher and he was telling me the way they do the organs is they cut, they cut up the, they cut open the cattle and then all the organs just pour onto a table. And then, you know, they'll cut out the, the, the liver. Your liver is usually the number one. And then a lot of times also the heart and then the spleen. But then pretty much that's where they, not the spleen, sorry. The heart, liver, kidney are usually the top three. Right. And then the other ones, they just kind of shuffle off, you know, to be ground up or go to the pet industry. They just don't take the time hmm. and it's not established. Yeah, that's actually was going to be my next question is where you source your, your you know, your organs from for your company is that it, so new zealand is is the it, yeah because there's there are like ancestral supplements and a lot of supplement companies are getting it from there I'm, I'm... yeah we actually I, I think we source from the same place actually ancestral supplements so it's anyone that's doing those that's just, we're, we're getting the same ingredients um the the um the key with New Zealand is, you know, they're, they're an island, so they're able to control the elements a lot better. They're, they're grass fed, grass finished, at least from the ranches uh, I'm getting from. And, 
they don't use GMO. They're, they're, they're not pumping the, the cows full of any hormones. So That's good. it's just, it's just a healthier product. And, you know, I can't emphasize that enough. I'm, I'm sure you may talk about this as well is when you're eating organs, you really do, you, you need to focus on quality because there is a false, there, there's a false uh, concept that people think of the organs because they're a filtration point for animals that they're also where toxins get stored. And then it's not true. They're, it's actually stored in the fat, typically. If it, any, any toxins that don't actually get, you know, leave the body are stored in the fat. However, if the animal is sick, mm-hmm. yeah, it's gonna get stored in the, or it's gonna get stored in lots of random places. Um, but yeah, the organs will not be clean and healthy. So you really can't, I, I would never recommend anyone that you're purchasing organs from a conventional cow. I mean, unless you, unless you personally know how that cow was raised, hmm. I, I, I think it's uh, chanty. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that the, that, um, the liver actually stores, stores, they could store these, uh, toxins, but they don't, they filter them out. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And that, and that's true. Even in our, our bodies, you know, like, you know, if we, if we dealt, if we digress into like detoxing, for example, you know, people, you know, detoxing is so popular, particularly the last few years. And it's like, everyone's getting on the detox bandwagon, but the reality is it's like, well, but if your toxins, if your elimination pathways are not cleared, mm. where are those toxins going to go? You know? And so, and it's the same thing, like with an animal, you got to make sure they're properly being fed. You got to make sure that they're not um, in a stressed out environment all the time, you know, you, right. it's very important. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a really big believer in, um, did you ever see that movie back in the day called chocolate or like water for chocolate? I have not. No. Oh, I highly recommend anyone that hasn't seen those, check them out. Both of the movies they're, they're, they're one's called like, like water for chocolate. And the other one is uh chocolate. Um, and they're both an emphasis on the energy you put into food. So when you're making the food, if you, if you filling it with love as you make it, that's what people will get when they eat it. And I'm a really, I mean, I've been cooking for, you know, like I said, over 16 years and I got to tell you, it's true. I mean, if I'm pissed off, stressed out, and that's what, how I'm making the food, you know, there's, there's energy permeates, you know what I mean? It's food is water soluble, you know what I mean? So energy permeates and it's, it's fascinating. And so I really do look at the healthy of the animal is going to equate to your own health. If you're eating that animal. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, uh, what would you say? Like, I mean, you've been a chef for a, a while and been in the culinary field for a long time. What would you say? Um, some of the, you know, main things that you saw to keep people healthy. I mean, I always say, if you can cook for yourself, you're way ahead of a lot of people, um, as far as getting back your health, because if you're always going out to restaurants, um, you know, you're just going to be consuming probably quite a bit of vegetable oils and things like that. Um, what are the, what, what were your go-tos as far as cooking for individuals and, and making sure that they're healthy? Yeah, you, you actually, that is one point I always tell people is like, if you're eating at restaurants, if, if you're getting food um, already packaged processed, basically, if you're not controlling the ingredients, you need to really be aware of what is being used. And here's a little story. So I, when I used to have that meal delivery in LA, mm. there was a, a few restaurants in LA where you would go to get food items, um, food items, or even to go boxes, any, anything like that. And one was called restaurant Depot. And there were, it's pretty much the predominant place. Most restaurants would go. Um, but I, at the time when I first started going, I was mostly going to get my delivery boxes, uh, like the little pa- the boxes that the food would go into, because um, a lot of my food I got from farmers markets. Mm. But when I first started going to this place, what would happen is there would be all these carts, and they would have the name of the restaurant, so they were already the food was already stacked on the cart. And it had the name of the restaurant who had ordered that food on it. And it was just basically waiting for someone to process it. And there'd just be cart after cart after cart. And I would start walking down the aisle and I see this and I'd be like, oh my God, this restaurant gets it here. That yeah. restaurant. I mean, I couldn't believe at the number of restaurants that I thought were more like farm to table. Right, we're right. getting their food here. And, and so, so people understand. So restaurant depot is like conventional as conventional can get. Mm. I mean, there's very little organic produce. 
um, the, it's, it's predominantly major, major uh, corporation run food, you know, craft is huge. And so a lot of times what you're seeing is you'll see someone, um, they'll have like a mayonnaise, a barbecue sauce, a teriyaki sauce, and you'll think that they made it from scratch, but no, they, they just bought it at Restaurant Depot. It's pre-packaged. It's got horrible oils in it, tons of sugar, um, just horrible ingredients. It's all the stuff that, you know, people like yourself are telling people to not eat. And it's, it's in all of it from canola oils to corn oils to soy oil. It's just in everything. And uh, so, yes, that is hands down. One thing you can do is don't assume that the restaurant that you think is healthy is doing everything from scratch, unless you're truly seeing them do it. Like they're very transparent right. and they have like, um, you know, like a walk-in where you can see through the window and you see the ingredients or you see the shelves with the ingredients. But I mean, that, that is hands down. Yeah. If you want to be healthy, you cannot eat out all the time. So that that's definitely one. Um, the other, the other big learning piece that I would share that's really underrated or just not as you not utilized as much as I think it should be, which is planning meal planning. Mm. It's, it's really huge, huge difference. Cause we're all emotional eaters. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're constantly, but we're constantly making choices uh, spontaneous choices based on emotion, based on hunger. And so the more you can plan your meals based on your week. And I, and I, and I like to get pretty granular. Like if I have a day where I'm just slammed and I know I'm going to be slammed, then that's a day where I would meal plan uh, a slow cooked meal. One that I could throw everything in at the morning, turn it on, schedule it, whatever. And then it's done when I'm done with my day. So that way I don't have to you know, in the middle of the day, start my food or do anything to it. So I really like to meal plan like that based on how busy the day is. Maybe I slow cook, maybe a different meal is like a simple one pot meal, you know, and then I get a little bit fancier, maybe on the weekend or something like that. But meal planning is great because you have a list, you go to the grocery store, you're not making any impulse buys, you just follow that list and you only buy what you're going to be using. Cause that's another issue is there's food waste is this, you know, it's, I can't even tell you how many people I've cooked for. It's just constantly just getting thrown at stuff is just constantly just getting wasted. It happens all the time. People purchase a whole thing of something and they don't use it. They don't get to it. It's in the back of the refrigerator. They don't, they just don't think about it. But when you meal plan, you know exactly what you're using. Yeah, no, that that's a great tip. I mean, um, if you, if you don't meal plan, you, that's when you sort of impulsive buy and get things that you probably shouldn't eat. Uh, which could be like fast food or something like that. But yeah, like for example, m- myself and my wife, we order a lot from like, you know, like a sustainable, like healthy farm and we'll get it in bulk and have it in the freezer. And then whatever we want that, that, you know, we just decide what we want the day before, leave it out. You know, we keep it pretty simple. We're not making like necessarily like these big um, gourmet meals, but it's either probably going to be some type of, you know, fish, meat or, um, yeah, something like that. We're pretty boring eaters. I feel like if you're a boring, boring eater, although, although that's why you have your company, right? Yeah. Cause it, <laughs> it sounds boring, but honestly, like, you know, a, you know, you put this on like, even like a ribeye, which I haven't tried it on a ribeye. We're going to try it on a white fish tonight. Um, what, how, what's the percentage of, um, organ meats in, in one of these? I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually tried, I tried doing it in all different capacities. Mm-hmm. Um, keeping in mind that my goal was to get past the following, which is a people aren't getting enough organ meats in their diet and B people associate the organ taste as being icky. So my goal was like, okay, I want to get uh, small doses of organ meat into your diet, mm-hmm. but in frequent use, because if you do that, you get a cumulative effect. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's true with even bad things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, we're certain we're, we're going after the cumulative effect. And I tried, I tried doing a 50, 50% organ meat to spices. And it was like, ah, oh, this is, this is a bit meaty. Like this is, this is, this is feeding into people's concept of like what organ meat tastes like when I did that. So I, I found a nice balance at around 15% um, to the spices, which if you use daily, um, you know, that's the whole goal is I'm trying to get you to use 
in every meal, just a pinch here, pinch there. And if you use it all the time, or basically replace salt and pepper, you will get that accumulative effect because an entire bag of pluck actually has a lot. Now, a pinch of pluck does not, I mean, because it's a pinch. Right, but right. if you if you go through the whole bag, you are getting nutrients where you previously were not. We do have some future flavors coming out actually uh, soon. And one of them that I'm going to do, um, and this this was kind of just from some feedback I got, but it, but it's more of like I just started to see that there was a market for it, which is I'm going to do a hundred percent organ meat blend. Like so, I'm basically going to oh, nice. do one where you can just order a, a pouch of organ meat. There's no salt in it. There's nothing added to it. So then that way you can control. Like let's just say you already have spices that you really like. You just add this. And like it's that. easier than having to open your capsules. It's going to be cheaper than ordering supplement capsules. So I just started to realize like, you know, there are people out there that want that. And then also what it kind of opens up to is that I've gotten some feedback from clients or customers that say my, when I get the pluck in the mail, I'm like my animal, my cat is going crazy for the pouch because they can smell it. Mm can you produce a hundred percent one so I can sprinkle it on their food? Oh. And I'm like, yeah, that's brilliant. Of course. So hey, you got a dog food out of it. <laughs> yeah. It's like a human. And cause that's the thing. Organs are like good for every, every living, you know, if, if you go in the wild and you see a lion attack a gazelle, what is the first thing they're eating? Right. They're going after the organs. Yeah. And, and the bones are just, they're, they're using all the things that, that they know are going to get the maximum, you know, bang most, their right. Exactly. And on that point, if someone listening saying, well, why maybe t t if you could speak on the health benefits and what's in like a liver that, you know, I know, you know, obviously you got protein and, you know, vitamin A and B vitamins and things like that. What, what are some of the biggest uh, benefits of uh, consuming organ meats? Well, so I, so pluck has five organs. Um, so it has liver, kidney, heart, pancreas, and spleen. And I, I did five because once again, I'm trying to get that nose to tail. So I'm trying to support people in getting more organs. Now, now liver is the one you hear about the most. It's, it's just got an amazing amount of heme iron, um, which is really important because heme iron means it's more absorbable for the body. If you're taking iron supplements, and it's not heme iron, it's not going to be as, as absorbable, you're probably peeing out most of it, and you don't even realize it. Um, yeah. And organs in general, because it's a whole food, every nutrient, so you have vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and K, um, essential minerals like iron, calcium, copper, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, and zinc. So it had, I mean, that's, that's in organs in general, right? They're kind of like the nat mother nature's multivitamin. Mm -hmm. And I always laugh because it's like, well, when, when you have someone taking a prenatal, what's in the prenatal? Oh, wait, it's everything I just listed. <laughs> so holy moly, that's why, you know, people trying to get pregnant, it's always emphasized, eat some organ, eat some liver. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the, like, so for example, let's just take a couple of them. So folate is one of the minerals and organs, and it plays a role in making and repairing DNA. Mm -hmm. It's producing red blood cells. So just in terms of like repair work that happens to your body, folate, so important. Um, the B vitamins, they help to convert uh, your food into glucose um, to produce energy. That's what B vitamins support. And B12 is something you hear a lot of people not getting in, for example, some vegan and vegetarian diets. The B organs have an, an abundance amount of B12. Um, spleen is high in vitamin C. Um, the heme iron is huge for both selenium, choline, preformed vitamin A, retinol. That's key. That's also uh, in kidney. So in general, like you, you kind of like look at, I don't know, every, every physical, you know, biological system in your body and what is needed. It's like, oh, it's an organ meat. Right. I mean, you name it and it's organ meat is providing that support heart, for example, is high in co coenzyme Q10 and it's preformed, which makes it more uh, absorbable. Um, it's and, co and CoQ10 is something that a lot of people are 
lacking. Hugely deficient. Yeah. Hugely deficient. And it's, and it's all for, it's vital for energy production and prevention of oxidative stress. And what's the biggest thing we all have is oxidative. I mean, we're the, the stress, the oxidative stress that's happening in everyone's body, the, the, uh, the inflammation that's happening. I mean, organ meats are going to support that. So it's, it's ironic that I, that I started in the midst of COVID, but honestly, like to me, organ meats are the, the, the food that you should be eating right now, no, all the time, but particularly right now. Yeah. And actually I just had the idea cause I do have, uh, you know, I make eggs a lot. This I gotta, I, yeah, I'm going to start putting this in my eggs. I mean, why not? You know? Oh, it's so good. That, that's, that's the one I get told the most is people say, oh, I love it in the eggs, but honestly, we, I've tried it on everything and, and I didn't mean, and you know, when I created it, I didn't know it, that it was going to be good and all this stuff. I just, I created and I tried a few things and I'm like, Hey, this is good. Let's put this out. And then I start getting feedback like, Oh, I tried this on uh, pomegranates and I tried this on <laughs> cheese and I tried this on toast. And it's like, and then I started, my kids love it. And we put it on like popcorn for family movie night. Um, right. we, I put it on salad. I put it on, you said fish. I've done fish. Oh, we did oysters one time. And it's just like, it's just, it's just so good. And one of the reasons I think that it tastes so good in food is because it's predominantly umami. And umami is what's considered the fifth unique taste. Um, you know, because you have bitter, sour, sweet, and salty. Mm. And then umami was discovered, and I think it was around the 1960s or early 70s. And um, it's a completely unique taste. But what it does is it actually makes the, it enhances the flavors of the other four. And a lot of times when you see buy packaged food, you'll hear of like MSG or, um, or you'll see sometimes in natural, they, they hide it in food sometimes and other, and other things. But the reason why they're adding things like MSG to products is to enhance the flavor. And it's because it's a naturally umami, and it's, sorry, MSG is not necessarily a natural source, depends on where they're getting it from, but it is, it's an umami that's why they're adding it because they know it's going to make, it's going to enhance the flavor. And then what it also does is, is um, it, it, the monosodium glutinate, it also like triggers that kind of addictive part of your brain. So you want to eat more and more and more. Have you tried it in water? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is, uh, is uh, Ben Greenfield put it in coffee. Uh, mm. And I had never even thought of doing it. Never even thought of, I'm like, what? And he did that. And I was like, that's crazy. But he's like, it's not bad. But it definitely gave me the idea of like, oh, I should create a beverage version of it, you know, because uh, it's no different than like, you know, four sigmatic mushroom, you know, like the way what they're doing with mushrooms. You got, there's no reason why I can't do that with organ meats. Yeah. And, and on here, like, you know, the idea of putting it on vegetables for people who are vegetarian and vegan. Were you I, I were you a vegan at one point? I know. I feel like everyone in the health field has always has come from somewhere. <laughs> I've been to, um, I've been to conferences, you know, wherever it, like Weston A. Price conferences. And, and if you don't know Weston A. Price, it's very much a meat eaters, you know, group. And, um, and Weston A. Price, uh, I remember they asked the whole room and I'm talking like hundreds of people, but they asked the whole room, okay, who here has ever been a vegan or vegetarian and the entire room <laughs> raised their hand. So yeah, I, I've tried everything. I mean, I, I you know, I experimented with just my own diet at different points before I was a chef. So at one point I was eating like all chicken and then I went eating all tofu. Um, and I, I tried vegan. I I've tried carnivore. I, I, a lot of times I'm just trying stuff because as a chef, I need to know how to cook it. I need to understand it. I need, right. to, I need to know what diet is kind of the trend and I need to be able to support clients who want to follow that trend. So I've always kind of done that um, naturally, but I, I personally, uh, I, I mean, I've listened to your podcast and, and, and I, I would say that we probably eat very similarly. Like I, I, I've just found when I was doing all tofu, holy moly, I, I completely lost my sex drive and I was only in my twenties. Yeah. That's a problem. I completely lost my sex. I just, it was like non-existent and I, and I, you know, I, my body, I, I was, uh, lots of, digestive distress from it and it just wasn't working for me and I, if anything i think i'm a huge proponent of eat however you want because everyone's got their journey you know so eat however you want 
But then when your body gives you feedback on what you ate, listen. Mm. That's kind of what I tell people is like, all I ask is that you listen to what your body feedback is. And if your body is not, if you're, if you have a lot of gas, if you're, if you're getting, you know, bad skin rashes and anything like that, if you're constipated, if you know, you name it, if some, if your body is physically reacting to what you're eating, you need to listen to that because that's telling you that it's not working. Yeah. That's a good, good piece of advice. I think a lot of times you might get some feedback and you sort of brush it off or you think it's something else, but it's, people don't realize how, how effective changing, you know, what you eat can, can really make just go such a long way. Well, it's yeah, absolutely. And what's sad too is, is for some reason, food or diets in general are one of those things that you don't, most people won't leave their comfort zone. You know, they kind of most people kind of do what they were, what they were raised with, mm -hmm. you know, or they find their kind of, they find their sweet spot, whatever that may mean. I mean, cause we, I say sweet spot and you would think that means healthy, but that's not necessarily what it means. It's just what's working for them. And I mean, like what's working environmentally for them, like in terms of their lifestyle, all that stuff. Right. But most people don't diverge very much. They don't take many risks with food. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's really fascinating because it's one of those, it's one of, it's the one realm where to truly make change with your diet, it's almost like you have to have a life threatening experience. Mm. I find most people, once they have some kind of illness threat or fear that comes up from getting sick or something like that, when something truly comes into fruition around their health, that is the thing that finally motivates them to make change. And it's sad to me that it, people have to wait for that because sometimes it's too late yeah. when, when that happens. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I mean, I work with, you know, middle-aged and up males and, you know, maybe they come to me, they fail the stress tests or, you know, something, something triggered them to want to make a change when really it's all about being proactive, right? I mean, um, take, you know, if, if you're proactive about your health, then, um, you're a way ahead of the game. Um, and, uh, I'm curious, this is a, a little bit, uh, not off the topic, but I know I've read in your, your bio that you've cooked for <laughs> Tom Cruise and, and Puff Daddy and uh, George Clooney. What did, uh, who was your favorite person um, th to cook for and who was your least favorite person to cook for? Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. Uh, so I, I, I really enjoyed, I, I really enjoyed my interactions with George Clooney. He, I, I would say he's probably my favorite um, mostly because of the interactions I had, they were very sporadic. Um, cause I didn't like with Tom, I was with him for almost two years and I was very intimate with him and I liked him a lot. Like, like I'm not trying to, uh, downplay working for him. It was, it was really a great experience. Um, but I just had, it's, it's more of the, the, the time that I had with George, um, I just really, I was a, I really respect him and, I just really liked his style. Like he, he gifted me some olive oil from his personal um, olive farm. And it, and it just, we had conversations about his dad and politics. And I was actually at his house when um, I was delivering. Yeah, we lost it for a second, but you're back. <laughs> Where, where did you lose me? Yeah, just recently. You were talking about George Clooney. You were at his house. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll yeah. start there. Um, uh, so I was at George's house, uh, and it was totally just happened. It was just circumstance. It, just, it happened to be this night, but it was on the night of uh, Barack Obama's winning of his second presidency. And, um, and so I was there that night when it happened, and I got to watch the festivities and talk to George about his dad's uh, time in politics. And just, it was just kind of amazing. And while I'm there, um, he got a, it was either an email or a text from Obama saying, thank you so much for supporting me. And I'm sitting there going, holy moly. <laughs> well, actually George at the time said, I can't believe, you know, a boy from, I can't remember where he's from, if it was Illinois, he, he said like from where he's from, um, a Maybe. boy from so-and-so just got texted by the president. I'm like, and I'm sitting there thinking in my head, I'm like, well, I can't believe I'm standing next mm -hmm. to George Clooney who just got texted by the president. So I just, I just had like, it was just the circumstances. It was just kind of cool. The few times I did get to hang out with him. Super nice guy though. Um, 
But in general, I, I will say this about the, all the celebrities I worked with. They're they're all when you know when I talk to them, I'm I'm just a person, and they're just a person. Um, and I I really was all just always so grateful I got let into their lives and got to to know them because one thing I found is you know a, a lot of celebs might have some strained relationships with their trainers, for example. Lost them briefly. Back. You there? Yep. Is that me or you? I wonder why it's so bad. Yeah, you know, you were you you were just coming in a little bit um scrambled, but where uh where where should I start over with the George Clooney one? No, or? no, you're good. I'm just recording it all and I'll have my guy edit it. Um okay. so you can start um you were talking oh yeah, but you learned from them or you were yeah, yeah. I'll I'll start from okay. Um so one thing I would say about all the celebrities I worked with, um, that every celebrity I worked with was really nice to me and I had a really clean relationship with them. And I honestly think that that is because you're always nice to the person cooking your food. <laughs> like <laughs> oh, good you point. never want to have a strained relationship with the person cooking your food. Now, I definitely can speak from my experience that some of them would have strained relationships with their trainers, mm. but that's because, you know, when you're pumping iron or when you're working out and getting aggressive with that, you know, emotions come out. So it's not necessarily that they didn't like each other, but it was more that the trainers would see kind of darker sides. Mm. I never saw that stuff. I mean, every, every person I worked with just was really cool. Um, like Gerard Butler had a really, really fun time with him. He, he's just a really great guy. Um, Tom as well. And uh, yeah, I, I really, I, that was a That's really cool. lovely experience and I'm very grateful to have worked for all those people. Yeah. I was curious. I just figured I'd ask. Um, so yeah, it's fun. It's, it was, it, it was a fun time and I, and I definitely have crazy stories that I can't even talk about because, you know, I signed uh, NDAs and all that stuff, but you know, yeah. it's, it's both the privilege and weirdness of Hollywood. <laughs> That's all I can say about it. Yeah, right. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, now uh, I just, yeah, I had eggs last night. I'm definitely going to try this on my eggs. Um, cause that's something I have almost probably every other day. Um, what do you like to put it on? Do you put it on pretty much ev almost everything that you have? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, 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 I even, you know, um, like when we do cook organ meats, for example, we even put it on. Put it on that. I mean, yeah. yeah. Cause it's one of those things kind of like, um, one of my friends would say, it's kind of like curry like so you might add turmeric to your curry you know it's like or right. you might add more cumin to your curry it's like just because it has organ meats doesn't re re restrict it from actually using it with organ meats um but i would love to share actually i have like a little for those that are listening you know of your audience that are not into organ meats yet i do have a little um kind of suggestive step you know, like staircase to getting more organs in your, in your diet. If you don't mind, I'd love sure. to share that. Sure. So, so the way that I, from my experience, I would recommend is, is you start with pluck. So pluck is definitely the easiest way to get organs in your diet because you don't have to know how to cook. You can even be eating out and just sprinkling on your food. It's sure. totally so easy, so easy. And then it doesn't taste like organs. But I really don't want you to stop there. Like, I really right. want to support people and continuing to get organs in your diet. So then I would say step two is, and you can kind of go either way. So, so if you're, let's say someone is a little squeamish about purchasing organs still, then I would say, okay, order, just get a beef liver. Okay. But usually when you get a beef liver, it's frozen. It's pretty large. Keep it in the freezer. Don't unfreeze it. Just keep it there. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm going to have you do is every time you're making some kind of ground meat, doesn't matter if it's for spaghetti, doesn't matter if it's hamburgers, however, just any ground meat, I would then take that frozen liver and I would shave it, you know, just use like a, use a little grater and mm -hmm. shave it into the ground meat. And, and I wouldn't do, you know, start small, you know, treat it kind of like you would if you were changing the diet of a pet. You know, they always advise you start with like 10% and then move on the way up, right? So it's the same way I would start with just doing, you know, maybe a couple tablespoons of shaved liver into the, and let's say if it's a pound of, of ground meat, 
you know, maybe do two tablespoons at first and then up it from there. And then I would, I would really not go beyond 25%. Um, I find that once, once you go beyond 25%, it changes the texture of the ground meat and then also the flavor. But if you're someone who likes that, then go, go 50, 50, if you really want, it doesn't matter. But right. if you're someone who's like, ah, I don't want the taste, then 25% I find is a good threshold. So the, the, I would do that next. And then the first organ, once you're ready to actually eat organs and you know cook them and actually deal with them, the first one I would try is heart. And I would even, I would even specify chicken hearts because the heart is more muscle than it's not, first of all. So it's going to be a closer consistency to muscle meat. Mm -hmm. secondly heart is really chicken hearts particularly they're very sweet they don't they don't have an organ taste they're really sweet they take on flavors really well um and if you don't want to look at the heart you know because they're small but if you don't want to look at it just chop it up add it to you know a saute or whatever uh but heart is just it's it's really simple i mean they cook really fast and they taste really good and then from there go to like tongue you know and then and then from tongue maybe buy beef heart and turn it into kind of like your experience with the heart chips. Like what you can do is slice it really thin and dehydrate it and turn it into beef jerky. Um, or you can simply cut off piece of piece of the organs and just mince it up with your other ground meat. But I find that those kind of three ways, you know, pluck first, then it's like um, shaving it. So keeping it frozen, because one of the biggest issues with organ meats is they're big and people once if they, they get intimidated by it, they're like, oh, if I dehydrate this whole thing, what do I do with it? And so I'm like, don't don't dehydrate, like don't. Um, sorry, I said dehydrate. I mean, defrost. Right. They're worried about defrosting it because then they have this whole thing that they got to use. So my whole point with step two is just don't defrost it. Leave it frozen. And then three, you're going into like the easy organs, which is like heart. Yeah, I, that's great advice. And, uh, and I like the one shaving the liver into ground meat because I've used a few companies that do it for, for you where they'll put some in their ground meat, they'll put like a small percent of, you know, heart liver, um, co company called force of nature. I've ordered. Yeah. I love that. I love that company. I use their stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. So they do it and, and other ones as well, but yeah, doing it yourself. I never thought about doing it. That's a great idea. I really, yeah. And like I said, the key is just don't defrost it. Cause that ultimately that's, that's really what, what it is around organs is like, it's not even just your association. It's you're intimidated. People are just intimidated by it. They're not familiar with cooking them, with eating them. Mm -hmm. So the, the first way to get over that hump is to utilize the food in a way that's non-intimidating. Mm -hmm. And, and that to me, leaving it frozen and just grating it is very unintimidating. It's just, it's just so simple. It's, it's almost like you're, you know, if you had frozen, I don't know, it's like grating garlic. I mean, it's not, it's, it's really not that different when it's frozen. Cause it's not bloody. There's nothing, it, there's just nothing awkward about it. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, that's great advice. And, uh, um, what, what would be one, this is a typical question I ask for most of my guests towards the end is what would be one piece of advice you'd give someone that, you know, maybe they're in their, you know, 50s, 60s and beyond, and they, they maybe want to get, get their body back to what it once was maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, what one piece of advice would you give that individual? So my gosh, I mean, and I, I feel like I've tried so many different things. Like one thing I I'm really into is, uh, is, is temperature, uh, therapy, you know, like cold plunges and, um, and, uh, um, infrared sauna and stuff those. like that. But I, I, I tend to not want like to give that kind of advice where you have to go out and buy some expensive contraption or some, something like that. I, I like to go for the simplest, most achievable things. And to me, the two, and, and I really, I really see them as, well, if I was to, if I was to say the most important thing, it has to be sleep. It yeah. just has to be like, I would say right away, you know, monitor and like start really, really being more mindful of your sleep. Um, and there's so many different things you can do that are simple, like make sure there's no light coming into your room. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure the temperature is cooler, not hotter. Um, make sure you're, you, you talk about this a lot, make sure you don't eat too late. Like, you know, and you're eating at like six or seven, if you're going around bed around nine, nine, 30, 10, like, there, there's little tricks, but the reason why sleep would be number one is because every decision you make is based on that sleep. 
Like I, when I, when I don't get good sleep, I make poor decisions around my food. Mm -hmm. When I don't make good sleep, I treat people poorly. You know, I, when I don't get good sleep, I treat myself poorly, you know, so everything starts there. And then I would say the second thing is, is water intake. Um, to me, if you're someone who's older wanting to make changes and you're not drinking predominantly, maybe even only water, then that would be the first thing I change is stop drinking all the other stuff. Cause what else would you be drinking? You'd be drinking probably teas, like, like iced teas, probably. Um, I know my, like, I'm thinking of someone who's older, like my dad, like he drinks a lot of lemonade. He still drinks soda. So you're, you're someone like him in that generation, like just stop that stuff and just switch just to water, whether it's carbonated water or flat water. Um, to me, those water. two are, yeah. are life-changing. And, and yeah, like, you know, I always say a lot of times you think you're hungry, but you're actually thirsty. <laughs> so yeah. take a drink of water, maybe some mineral water. And, um, and then, yeah, like getting your calories from, from, um, liquids, um, is, is just not a good route to go because you absorb it faster than anything else. It's like when people have these smoothies and they take the fruit and, you know, mix it up and grind it up, you know, you're going to lose a lot of the nutrients just from the processing alone and the fiber and things like that. When you're better off, if you're going to have it, just have the actual fruit <laughs> yeah, and, and mix it up. Um, absolutely. Yeah. That. Awesome advice. And, uh, James, well, this was good. I, I appreciate you coming on and I'm definitely going to, uh, start implementing your product and a lot of my food. So, um, this is a great way to get organ meat to the masses. And I, you know, I appreciate you, you doing that. So, yeah, absolutely. And, um, anyone that, uh, wants to find it can go to eat right. That's where we sell it right now. And we're hoping in the new year, we'll be in more retail stores. Um, but eat pluck and um and if you subscribe to our newsletter we we immediately send you a discount a 10 percent discount for your first order awesome all right eat pluck thanks so much james thank you have a great one too hey get lean eat clean nation are you a man between the ages of 40 and 60 years old looking to lose inches around your waist have significantly more energy throughout the day and gain muscle all while minimizing the risk of injuries? Well, I'm looking for three to five people to work one-on-one -on -one with in my Fat Burner Blueprint Signature Program, which I've developed by utilizing my 15 years experience in the health and fitness space. This program is designed specifically for those committed to making serious progress towards our health goals over the next six months. We will focus on sleep, stress, nutrition, meal timing, and building lean muscle. If this sounds like a fit for you, email me at brian at briangrin.com with the subject line blueprint. That's brian at briangrin.com with the subject line blueprint. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.